Hey guys, it's Sarah from Just My Typewriter. I get asked pretty often on Instagram and on YouTube, what do you write? You have like 30 gazillion typewriters. What do you actually write? And the truth is I am not a writer by any definition. What I love about typewriters, besides the fact that they're amazing, is that there's a lot of historical information to go through and research. Every time I get a new typewriter, I'm learning something new. Whether that's a new repair tactic I'm learning how to do, or I'm going into a deep dive on the history of that company or model or the advertising behind of it. There's so much information to look into when it comes to typewriters. And as somebody who's really interested in history and who loves Googling things, Things, I find that to be the best part of typewriter collecting. I love doing a deep dive on any new thing I learn and I've been really lucky that every once in a while those two passions of researching something new and typewriter history kind of coincide. Now you'll know probably from watching some of the other videos on this YouTube channel that I try to forcibly make my hobbies intersect in different videos. I collect nail polish and I also collect typewriters. Now you may think that these are two totally different worlds and maybe they are, but I was really lucky that I found one very specific advertisement from 1955 advertising the Underwood 150 that actually combined my two favorite things typewriters and nail polish. So I found this advertisement online and of course I had to buy it. Not only did I have to buy it, I also had to frame it. So now I have it forever. This advertisement was released in 1955 in the Underwood catalog and it actually details some of the functionalities of the 1955 Underwood 150. And the big selling point in this specific advertisement was that the key shape on the Underwood 150 was specifically designed for secretaries who had longer nails. Now in the 1940s, nail trends were a lot shorter because women were working in more factory environments due to World War II. But as you get into 1950s nail trends, which is a thing I've done a lot of research on these past few weeks, you'll find that nails were actually considered to be more beautiful if they were longer. It was a more feminine look as women were going back into the office. So women would have these longer nails with this beautiful paint across them. They would go to use their typewriter keys and they would chip the ends of their nails. Now to solve this problem, Underwood advertised that they had changed their key shape design to have a more rounded base to fit your fingertips and a half moon design across the top of the Underwood 150 key so that you could have longer nails and not chip them by using that specific key shape. Now whether that's true or not, I don't really know. But if you've seen some of my Underwood videos before, you'll know that I've also talked about the Underwood Golden Touch design, which is again their key shape design, which is described in this book, Typewriters by Anthony Casillo, to have a more rounded shape to the base of the key so that your fingers would be cupped kind of by that key shape design rather than having some sort of flat key that you press down. So between these two innovations, Underwood really found different ways to market to their audiences. They were marketing to women in the office, the secretaries, they're the ones who would decide which typewriter was best for the job and the ones who would ask their boss to purchase that typewriter for the office. So part of their marketing ploy was to advertise specifically to secretaries secretaries who were thinking about things like their manicures and how they'd get chipped on typewriters and using their key shape design as a way to kind of solve that problem. Now this specific advertisement has another aspect to the marketing campaign. They actually state on the advertisement that if you write in on the company letterhead of the place that you work and request a bottle of Underwood red nail polish, they would send it to you along with your 150. Now as I was falling down this hole and buying that advertisement on eBay, I also ran into a ton of ads of nail polish from the 1950s. Now I tried to look everywhere for that Underwood red nail polish. I tried to find old bottles of the Underwood nail polish. I tried to match the bottle shape from the advertisement to bottles made by other companies who made nail polish at the same time. It didn't necessarily make sense to me that Underwood would start making their own nail polish. I figured that they were just taking someone else's nail polish and rebranding it as Underwood Red, but I had no luck in matching that very specific bottle shape of the 1955 ad to any of the companies making nail polish at the time. However, I was very lucky in falling into some other avenues of eBay where I ran into some actual nail polish from the 1950s. Like, still in the bottle nail polish. I don't know how it survived this long, but I ended up buying one of those too. And what this did was it kind of led me down this 
research internet rabbit hole where I started to look into the history of nail polish specifically. Because if it was something important enough to people to actually mention in an advertisement, maybe it was something important enough to look into as an aspect of beauty history, but also the history of the women who are actually using these machines. So I'm about to talk a lot about nail polish, but I promise it's relevant. Now the nail polish that I ended up purchasing was Q-Tex Slightly Scarlet. You might know Q-Tex now for their nail polish remover, and they actually started with a chemical cuticle remover. That was their first product, but they did get into the nail polishes in around 1913. And original nail polish was actually a little cake form that you would literally buff into your nail, kind of like shoe polish, hence the name nail polish. In 1916, they actually released their first liquid enamel form of nail polish. So the liquid we're familiar with with nail polish, they actually started with a clear form as a way to kind of protect your natural nail underneath uh, that liquid topper, but they started adding a rosy tint to it so that you could actually kind of paint your nail in a specific color. And that's where we started getting the more familiar nail polishes to us in a modern context. By 1933, Q-Tex had seven official shades in their line, and let's see if I can remember them all. Coral, Cardinal, Garnet, Neutral, no, natural, deep red, clear, and ruby. So those were the seven different shades actually included in the Q-Tex line. Later in the 1930s, they actually expanded into lipsticks, and we'll talk about why in a little bit. But Q-Tex had competition. In 1934, a company named Revlon was started, and they started with their own nail polish line as well. And by 1939, they were producing their own lipsticks. Now, Revlon actually started by selling specifically to manicure artists and salons, which is what Q-Tex was doing as well. But what Revlon did, which kind of revolutionized the nail polish industry, is after they were selling to manicurists and salons, they actually started making their product available in drugstores and different makeup department stores. Now this meant that as an at-home user, you could go out and get your favorite shade of nail polish and actually do your manicures at home. Now between the 60s and the 2000s, Q-Tex really started to decline. They were passed around from company to company, bought and sold dozens of times, and they started to reduce the number of different nail specific shades that they had and really focused on things like nail polish remover, which they still have their brand name across products today. And then in 20s, 16 Revlon was the victor. They actually bought Q-Tex in 2016 and they won the war on that one. So that's a little bit of history behind the company that actually made the nail polish that I bought and they were one of the big giants in the industry. But another thing that's really interesting about nail polish history is the difference in nail polish styles across the different decades and how it's reflective of the time period. So in the 1920s when nail polish actually started to exist, the common manicure was actually to have a half moon shape around your cuticle area and then also another dip around the tip of your nail. So you were really only polishing that center section. And that was really helpful because you could leave that polish on there for a really long time. So if you ran into something and chipped the edge of your nail, you wouldn't notice. And if your nail was growing out, you wouldn't even notice around the cuticle area either that it was no longer touching the edge of your nail. In the 1930s, we actually started to see red shades in nail polish. And it was a much cheaper way to accessorize your outfit and something that you could actually afford to change. You could change your nail polish more than you could go out and buy a new dress to change the way you looked. In the 1940s, clear coats and base coats actually became super important. Now, base coat is like a primer underneath the nail lacquer color on top, and top coats are usually clear that you can put on top to protect that color. These were introduced in the 1940s as women went to work in factories and take some of the men's jobs that were out there fighting in World War II. These were advertised as ways to maintain that feminine look and keep your nails still clean and protected while you were doing more masculine jobs. In the 1950s, red nails became the thing. They were highly featured on starlets, on different movie stars, people on TV and movies, famous people. And it was also very popular to match your nails to your lip color. The 1950s is also important because it was where the invention of the acrylic nail came into play. Now, acrylic nails are nails that you can put on top or build onto your natural nail to make your nails extended and longer and have more space for painting different colors or nail art designs. The 1960s are noted for having more subtle colors than the 1950s. You might have a big red bold color in the 1950s, but in the 1960s it was a little bit more subtle and they had a lot of pearlized finishes, which is 
a finish that is not necessarily shiny on top, but a little bit more muted and a little bit more streaky of a finish, kind of like a pearl. In the 1970s, it was very popular to have no nail colors or have a very bare nail. The French manicure also became more popular during the 1970s, and that's where you might have a colored or white tip across your nail with a more neutral colored nail. Now, the 80s was a mega departure from the 1970s. As we got into nail trends, they had the inclusion of neon colors, really bright, vibrant colors on nails that matched the style of the pop music at the time. The 90s kind of went the other way and did really dark nails. So you would have things like black nail polish, deep blues, dark reds. And as we get into the 2000s when it comes to nail polish, we're looking at things like specialty finishes, textured finishes, a lot of additions of glitters, shimmers, matte finishes, a lot of different textures applied to your specific nail colors, and a lot more variety. Now there are actually still some nail trends from nail polish history that are still relevant in today's nail polish finishes, scents, looks, designs. There are a lot of interesting things that I found going through these advertisements, and I went through a lot of advertisements that I still see reflected today in the nail polish industry. One of the first things that popped out to me was I found a nail polish ad from the 1930s, where a company actually took all the shades in their line and printed them out in kind of like a paper doll design, where you could actually cut out a nail shape and tape it to your nail to see if you liked how that color looked against your skin tone. Now this is actually reflected to day on different nail polish websites. You can go to Essie's website, you can go to OPI's website, and actually upload a picture of your hand and try out their different nail colors virtually on their websites to see which kind of shades match best with your skin tones. Now in the 1950s, I found an advertisement from Duraglass that advertised scented nail polish. Now that probably sounds like something you would only get in children's nail polish these days, but a very popular nail polish company, Sinful Colors, actually released a line of scent scented nail polishes a few years ago. So they have the Essentials line, which are different colors that are actually scented like essential oils. I have quite a few of those. They literally do smell like different things. They also had a food related line a few years ago where they had things that smelled like tacos and donuts. I mean, there's still nail polish in there, but they definitely have some sort of scent to them. And I thought that that was interesting to see starting in the 1950s. Another thing that actually stood out to me was when you look at early nail polishes, things like the nail polish cakes or the beginning of the liquid formula in 1916 when they started adding light pink tints to those liquid enamel formulas, it's actually kind of reflective of the jelly formula of nail polish that we have now. So the jelly formula, and one of my favorites is Orly Sweetheart from their Valentine's Day line, is a lot thinner and it has a lot more translucence to it. So you can apply it over things to add more of a tint than you would to actually color your nails. I also started reading more books on nail polish because it's very easy for me to fall into a hole when it comes to researching things. And I read this book, I'm Not Really a Waitress, How One Woman Took Over the Beauty Industry. This is actually written by one of the co-founders of OPI, which is one of the more popular nail polish brands right now that you would have in a salon finish, and they started selling their nail polishes specifically to manicure artists and salons instead of selling to the at-home consumer. Now when we think of nail polish today, you can either go into a salon and get your nails done, or you can pick up a nail polish at your local drugstore, grocery store, I find a lot of TJ Maxx for some reason. You can pick up your own shades and do manicures at home. But just like Q-Tex and Revlon in the 1930s, they were starting by selling their products to salon manicurists, and then finally did expand into more retail locations so that you could do an at-home manicure. So I thought that was really interesting. As I was reading her book, I was thinking about the parallels between the journey of OPI and companies like Q-Tex and Revlon. Another thing I noticed was that there are still companies trying to match nails to lips. Now again, that was very popular in the 1950s. Some of the most popular shades in drugstores and salons when you're selling products when it comes to lip colors are the pinks, the reds, and the corals. These are usually universally flattering. You can have a lot of differentiation in the different shades and it'll probably look good on a lot of people. You also have the same in nail polishes. The most popular shades in nail polish, especially when you're selling in a retail location, are those reds and those pinks. That's why they make a ton of them when they're releasing new nail polish lines. They're just the most popular shades. 
pink feels appropriate for a lot of people in different situations. So those are the most popular colors from the 1950s that are still the most popular shades today. But it's also really interesting to see how those kind of concepts apply to selling nail polish today. When those are your most popular colors, it makes sense for nail polish companies to expand into lipsticks because they're similar shades. So both Cutex and Revlon made lipsticks to match their specific nail polish shades, and they would sell those as a set, match your nails to your lips. You can also do that in a more modern context. Now, OPI actually tried to release their own line of lipsticks that would match some of their most popular shades. Now, that didn't really work out for them, but they did really consider that as a tactic, and it is a nice parallel to the Cutex and Revlon line again. Now, I also wanna talk about a company called Besame. Now, they're a small family-owned business in California where they really focus on vintage cosmetics, and they're really popular for, again, matching specific nail shades to specific lipsticks. So that you can get yourself a full set of a matching nail polish and a matching lipstick. And I found one of those recently. This is my Mrs. Banks set. This has a matching nail polish and a matching lipstick to each other packaged in one set, much like Cutex and Revlon would have done. They also have shades in their line that are reminiscent of original colors that would have been released at the time. So if you go through their website and you look at their different nail polishes, they have shades on their website that are recreations of the most popular shades at the time. So I have a few of those as well. And I think that's a really interesting part of nail polish history that even now as we have all this variety, we're going back and trying to recreate the classic reds and pinks because they were so popular and kind of important to nail polish history. So now that I have a nail polish from 1955, the same year as that advertisement, I figured the only logical thing to do was actually to sit down and test all my red nail polishes against it and try to get the closest color match. You didn't think we wouldn't be color matching in a video about typewriters and nail polish, right? Here we go again with a lot of nail polish and one very specific goal. I started by swatching my 1955 Slightly Scarlet from Cutex. I wouldn't advise using this on your nails because it smells like a very spoiled vinegar and the shade itself is very deep and it has a high shine gloss to its finish. So I swatched a variety of reds including Revlon, Orly, some drugstore brands, and a Besame Cosmetics shade too. So here's Slightly Scarlet and here are my closest contenders. Besame Red Velvet, LA Colors Vampire, Revlon Revlon Red. All these shades were a similar tone, but the finish itself wasn't even close. So I decided to try a high shine gloss finish in a jelly nail polish, Sweetheart by Orly. And here's where you can see how it matches the shiny finish. So my best guess is a base shade of red velvet by Besame with a top coat of jelly red nail polish for shine in order to get slightly scarlet. So why does this matter? This is a typewriter channel. You did not come here to have me talk about makeup trends from the 1920s to the 2000s. Why is this important? This is specifically important to me and I think it's important to typewriter collectors in general because I look at typewriters as historical artifacts. Yes, they are machines that you can use to write and to do all sorts of things and I think that's amazing. But what's really interesting to me specifically about typewriters is their changes in design over time. I think it's really reflective of the lives people were living in the different historical eras that those typewriters come from. You can look at things like different portable designs and the different colors that were introduced in the 60s that was really relevant to the culture at the time. We were leaving that buttoned up 1950s society and getting into really colorful machines in the 60s. Or you could look at different functions, magic margins, even electric typewriters were reflective of this innovation happening in the industry. And I think that's really important to point out. Now, if you look at advertisements for typewriters from the 1940s up until the 1980s, a lot of them feature women specifically. And I think this is important to note because they're really trying to target the audience of the user in the workplace. Yes, a guy would have a typewriter on his desk, but if he had a secretary, it was more likely that she was going to be the one using the typewriter on a more consistent basis. So when a company like Underwood features an advertisement that speaks directly to the female consumer about some of the things she might be interested in in that product and makes a sales promotion specifically to her, you can really see the importance that women had on the typewriter industry. 
they were the ones making those purchasing decisions when it came to different brands of typewriters in the workplace. They were interested in things like the different functionalities in the machines, the different features, and I think that's really interesting to look at in these advertisements as well. They weren't just saying, hey, look at this pretty typewriter. They were saying, here are some of the functions that might help you be more productive in the workplace and also make this typewriter more interesting to you. So that's a little bit of history. I know, probably too much history for you, but that's a little bit more of a connection between things that I love, typewriters and nail polish. They do have an intertwined history, and I do think that it's relevant enough to point out, even though this was really just for me, I really wanted to look into this. If you're interested in more typewriter content, I do have some more typewriter specific videos on this YouTube channel, and I also have an Instagram at just.my.typewriter. I want to thank you all so much for watching today and for indulging me as I went down this rabbit hole. I really appreciate it, and I want to remind you that you're just my type writer.